to sing. He was never ashamed of me. When he came to me, he placed on me. I will sing before the love of my life. I will sing before the love of my life. I am not ashamed to sing. He was never ashamed of me. When he sang to me, his grace on me. Oh, on the cross of Calvary, he's lavished itself on me. Something I bring will never be enough. Sacrifice to them. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to class. It's been a fantastic week, I believe. How are you doing so far into this week? I believe that God has been faithful and kind to you and yours as he's been to me. Welcome to class. As you come in, please do the needful. Share share the links so that someone else can come in as well we're going to be studying exodus chapter number 19 and this is a part two if you are here last week you will see all that we learned out of the first part of exodus chapter 19. today we want to quickly see how the lord will help us finish it i see a lot packed into the rest of the chapter but i'd rather that i'll do my best to finish this evening what that means is i'll be going a bit fast and i will not i probably not be um, repeating myself a lot but i promise you it's going to be worth your while so where are your brothers and sisters invite them to come in so that we can have a good time before god this evening as we're sharing the link and we're saying our welcomes can we begin to bless the name of the lord this evening just thank him for the opportunity of the life that you have. Thank him that you have breath and you are able to come. There are many that seek this opportunity to come sit at the foot of Jesus, but they are not able to do so. You have that opportunity. And I think that sometimes we can take many of these things for granted. So let's pray that, spend a few minutes this evening to just thank God for the life that we have. Give him praise for the things he's done concerning your life. Give him praise for what he's doing right now, for what he will do. Glorify his name and just honor him. Father, I thank you for the gift of life today. Thank you for the opportunity to come sit at your feet again and learn. Thank you for the things you've taught us in the past. Thank you for what you will teach us this evening. To you be all the glory. To you be all the honor. <clears throat> to you be all adoration. Sweet Holy Spirit, I submit and surrender to you that you take over my being and use me for your glory today. Let the word that we'll hear today, let it be strength for somebody. Let it be fuel for another person. Let it be reprimand for someone that no matter what it is to us, may it bring us closer to you in the name of Jesus. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are on the broadcast this evening and ask, Lord, that their hearts are prepared and their hearts are receptive. Father, that as your spirit begins to go around spreading the word and bringing cheer and shedding light where we have had a bit of a darkness, Lord, that our hearts will be receptive, that we will embrace that which you're saying to us and that your name will be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done even before this class is started and what you will do even as we go on. May all the glory, may all the honor, and may all the adoration be yours now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the broadcast again. If you shared the link, I am grateful. If you're here to share the link, please do so. When we do that, more people come in, and the more of us who get to hear the word and understand what the Lord is doing, the better for us. Last week, we started Exodus chapter 19, and we saw <coughs> what um, God does with people when he takes them on the journey of life. One of the big things that stood out for me last week is the fact 
that when God takes us out of anything, he brings us to himself. So when God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them to himself. He wasn't bringing them to just to bring them into a land. We tend to think that when God brings us out of something or God puts his hand on us, we tend to think that sometimes, especially when you are used of God for ministry and stuff like that, the tendency is to begin to believe that God brought you just so that you can do those things that he's called you to do. The first reason why God puts his hand on a man is to bring the man to himself. Because unless you, are, you have come to God, there are many things that you cannot do in him. So we saw that that stood out for me really clear last week. Something else we saw is that God speaks. Because I, I started to see <clears throat> out of Exodus chapter 19 how God started to talk about us. Even the prophecy that we will be a peculiar people, a strange, unusual, odd, unfamiliar, abnormal treasure. Remember that people who are precious, people who are wealthy, the riches of the kingdom, people who are stored up unto God. We saw all of that last week. And the Lord made us understand through the way he spoke to Moses that all the things that he's promised that he's able to do simply because he's the owner of the earth. He's the God of the earth. He's the governor of the nations. So there is nothing that he, com uh, he, <clears throat> he promises that he's not able to bring to pass. Today we want to begin a study right out of verse number nine. And like I said, it's a lot, but I'm trusting God to help us through and bring us to the end of today's, um, of the chapter. In Proverbs, um, sorry, in Exodus 19, this, this second part, I have tagged it boundaries, obedience, and grace. Boundaries, obedience, grace. These are the three things that you will find in Exodus chapter 19 from beginning from verse number nine. You will see boundaries that God sets boundaries for his people and you will see why. You will see the power of obedience. <clears throat> And we will go from Exodus 19 to Hebrews chapter 12 to try and understand the concept of grace, to distinguish between the Mount Zion and Mount Sinai, to see that even as great as Mount Sinai was in the old covenant, in the new covenant, we have something called Mount Zion. And to see what the difference is and what God message God wants to bring for us today. So in verse number nine, it says, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may believe and trust in you forever. Then Moses repeated the words of the people to the Lord. Last week, I did make the allusion that when God puts his hand on a man to use the man, it is God's responsibility to prove to the, to the, the people that he has his hand on the man. A man doesn't need to print a billboard to say that he's a great man of God. God by himself, by his acts in the life of the man and through the man, we announce to the people that his hand is upon the man. So when it was time for God to, because God knew that the people didn't quite trust <clears throat> In Moses' leadership, 100%, they had their doubts back and forth. God decided, he said to Moses, they called the people together. I will put you on display so that they might trust you forever. Is it not fantastic and awesome to think that God will put his hand on me and then he's the one whose job and responsibility it is to get the people to trust me? That it's not my job to try to sell myself. It's not my job to try to apple polish. It's not my job to try to launder my image. God by himself will get all of that done and ensure that we arrive where we need to go. So God said to Moses, he said, look, here's what is going to happen. I'm going to come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak to you and they may believe and trust in you forever. It's amazing that when God puts his <clears throat> his hand on a man he is not so uh, too concerned about the fact that people will trust the man because if the man is a signboard to God then God isn't bothered he wasn't saying so that they will believe in me forever he knew that his um his imprint had to be on Moses' life for Moses to be able to lead these people conclus conclusively to where he wanted them to go so God said to Moses, this is what I'm going to do. And Moses 
after listening to God, repeated the words of the people to the Lord. Because remember, the people had said to Moses, the words that you speak are fine. Whatever you say we should do, we will do. The Lord also said to Moses, I'm reading verse number 10, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. That is, prepare them for my sacred purpose. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on the third day, the Lord will come on Mount Sinai in the cloud in the sight of all the people. You shall set barriers for the people all around the mountain, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch his brother. Whoever touches the mountain must be put to death. I said that our theme for this evening is boundaries, obedience, and grace. A lot of us think that because we are in a relationship with God, that there are no boundaries, that there are no parameters. That is why we abuse grace. We think that there is no decorum. We think that there is no protocol. We act like everything, any and everything goes. But even for the best of <clears throat> or the men who were close, who walked the closest to God, God had templates. God had boundaries. God had parameters. The children of Israel were not an exception. God was going to speak to Moses and the children of Israel were going to audibly hear God speak. Yeah, God said to them, he said, look, because I was speaking from a cloud from the top of the mountain, make sure you set parameters around the mountain. They must not touch the mountain because my presence will be there. It's interest, instructive that before God even said to them, set parameters, he said to them, Tell, prepare the people. They have to, for my sacred purpose, have them wash their clothes. Let them be ready by the third day. It's amazing that God can call me, yet I have to wash my clothes. It is amazing that God can call me, yet I have to make myself ready. <clears throat> It is amazing that God can call me, yet I have to consecrate myself. Because what I see is that people run around thinking that just because they have the call of God on their lives, that there are no boundaries. We abuse any and everything and we call it grace. But what I find is that God's template is that even though I have brought you to me, there are things, there are processes that you must follow if you want to consistently have access to me. So God was coming to talk to Moses, to the hearing of the people, but the people had to consecrate themselves. Let me take another step back and, 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 and look at it again. To think that God wanted to speak to Moses, but the people had to consecrate themselves. Pay attention to me. God wanted to speak to Moses, but the people had to consecrate themselves. Do you know how we do it these days? Everything about God and receiving from God and hearing from God and holiness, we think is the forte of the pastor. It's a pastor that needs to be holy. After all, me, I'm just a more Joe. That's what we say. I, I, did, I they didn't call me. They didn't call me to this one. It's a pastor that was called. Can't you see that that is why we are people who don't get to receive much from God? Can you see that? Because even though God is called Moses and God wanted to speak to Moses, the people still had to consecrate themselves. So what does that even mean? What it means is that a people who do not consecrate themselves may never quite be able to receive from God. Remember that these people were going to hear God. God was going to speak to Moses. They were going to hear and yet they needed to consecrate themselves. No wonder we go to church 15 times a week and yet our lives are not changed because nobody, either nobody has told us or we've chosen not to believe that there is a work of consecration that we need to do so that what God brings to us, we can receive it. So God said, tell them to consecrate themselves because if they are not consecrated, they should be consecrated. Yet he even told them, he said, they can't touch they can't break the barrier or the parameter and touch the mountain. Because if they do, they will die. And somebody is saying, is God that wicked? No. But the Bible does tell me that God cannot behold iniquity. And you need to understand, just as I'm trying to understand, and I trust in God to help me understand this evening, that there are templates in God. 
<laughs> when I say these things, it, it sounds to some people like I'm saying I'm claiming some exclusive rights to something. I'm not claiming any exclusivity to anything. I'm just telling us what it is. There are templates in God. The more of the templates you understand and you embrace, the better your relationship with God. The better your relationship with God, the more you tend to receive from him. Is that, does that mean that God does, quit quote pro, you give me and give you, is it teeth for tat? That's not what I'm saying. But who wants to, which one of, of, of us on this broadcast this evening wants to take our precious things and cast them to swine? Do you want to take your white, white outfit and put it on a pig? We don't do that. So why would God not insist on consecration? God is coming for a church without blemish or wrinkle. Whether we believe it or not, that's what God is coming from. That's what Jesus is coming back from. And from the Old Testament, we already saw the standard. It just does not make sense that we run around thinking that God has no standard. God has standards. That's number one from that scripture. Number two is that the work of the man and woman of God over the people is to prepare for God a sanctified, consecrated, pure people. That's my job as a pastor as the well. That's my job on this broadcast and every platform that God calls me to. My responsibility is to prepare, present myself sanctified, consecrated, pure. And my responsibility to you is not to teach you how to get more money in God. My responsibility is not to get you to have triplets. And I know a lot of people would not like what I'm trying about to say now. My responsibility is not to make you rich. It is not by the laying, of, um, laying on of my hands that you become rich. All of those other things are in the God department to do. They are in the folder, the God, something for God to do folder. My job every single day is to make sure I present to him. I prepare you and present for, to him a people's called a set apart, a people called out, a people separated, a people sanctified, a people consecrated, a people pure, without blemish, without wrinkle. If I can present that kind of person to God, God is bound to bless that person. God is bound to heal that person. Well, I use bound loosely because God is not bound to do anything, yes? But to think that it is your pastor's responsibility to pray so you get a job, that's too much to put on a man. To think that it's your pastor's responsibility to pray so that you can get pregnant, that is too much to put on a man. A man does not have the capacity to give any of that. All of those things are given by God. The assignment your pastor has and the assignment I have is to prepare you to know God for yourself. And the first step is you are set apart. I have to help you understand that you are called out. I have to tell you that God cannot behold sin. It is my job to express, explain to you what the process of sanctification is. My job is to help you walk in the path of consecration. It is my job to consistently remind you that purity is something that God holds dear and high. If I do my job well, if you... If you um, if you cooperate with me and I do my job well, then God will do what he needs to do. Oh no, it's not because I can't pray that you are not healed. I will pray by faith. But let's take another a step back and take a look at us. When I learned this truth, I started to realize that no man needs to go for, to God on my behalf. There are many things that if I just did them, if I put, if I stood within the, or kept myself, <coughs> excuse me, if I kept myself within the boundary that God, God has set for me, if I obeyed the instructions that he, he, he's given me, if I do not abuse grace, then I can come by myself and ask God, for what he wants me to be. Do you 
understand this process. God said to Moses, prepared for me a sanctified people, a people that are separated, a people that are consecrated. Give them the instruction to wash their clothes. When we studied the book of Joshua, God said to Joshua, circumcise them, bring them into covenant with me. And then I will take them into the promised land. What we want to do is we want men to take us in. We want men to stand in the gap for us. That's why you pay people money to fast on your behalf. Please come and pay me to fast. I've been doing 40 days. If you give me the money, I promise you I'll put it to good use. But how dare you pay someone to fast for you? Are you not ashamed of yourself that somebody like you stands in front of you and says to you that he will fast on your behalf and charges you money and you give it to him? Tomorrow you will say pastors are thieves. You were the one that made yourself gullible. The job of the pastor is to prepare you before you a people consecrated. Your pastor doesn't owe you anything else. It's not a pastor's responsibility to build you a cathedral that has that is a seed. If he can prepare you under a canopy or under a tree, a sanctified people, his work is done. We need to stop putting unnecessary pressure on men of God. This is the reason why some clueless men of God find themselves dabbling into things because they want to please the people who are looking onto them to bring forth miracles. I don't do miracles. It's not my job. That's in the department of God by himself. My job is to tell you how to access them. And I know holiness does it. I know living a life of purity does it. I know a life of obedience does it. It gives you access to the Father. You climb on his, knee, on his laps and you ask him for anything. That is the responsibility. God said to Moses, you shall set barriers for the people all around the mountain. When people come to church and you say to them, fornication is sin, they get angry. How dare you tell me what I should do? He is judging me. She is judging me. Jump where? Look at your life now. He said to Moses, he said, make sure you set boundaries. It wasn't God that set the boundaries. It was Moses that set the boundaries. It was, which meant that Moses said, you can come this far. You can't go beyond this, 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 this uh, distance. This is how you do it. Get out of there. Do not do that. You can't come beyond here. Moses was the one that determined what the distance should be. My brothers and my sisters, allow those who God is called to lead you to help you. If they were not needful, God would not have picked them. If God has picked them and you have found yourself under the same shade with them, let them do their work. Okay? So what God wants... All the people that God is looking for are a people that I call a tap people, T-A-P, a tap people, a transformed, authorized, and productive people. Those are the kinds of people that God is looking for. And it takes a living in purity. It takes a living in obedience. It takes a doing what God has called you to do for you to be a transformed person, for you to be an authorized person, and to be, for you to be a productive person. You don't become productive by the laying on of hands. That's not how it works. I had not gotten married when I caught this revelation. Because then as young ladies and young men, every major service, there will be an announcement that if you're waiting on the Lord for marriage, you should stroll forward. And then someone will lay hands on you and pray. I had to say to God, I said, if a husband is that scarce, and it wasn't pride, I was just exercising my faith. If a husband is that scarce that someone has to lay hands on me week in, week out, then perhaps I don't need to marry. I remember one day I was in a church service and they made that announcement again and I was seated where I was. I remember vividly that my auntie walked to the back where I was seated and said, 
They call me blessing at home. I said, blessing, you will not go forward. I said, no, auntie, I'm not going forward. He said, why? I said, auntie, if I will marry, God will, God will do it. I'm not going to be lining, lining up in front of man to lay hands on me simply because if I now have a serious issue, where do I go? If ordinary marriage, somebody has to lay hands on me. And please, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying that when you come to understanding, you do some crazy things. And that's why 24 years later, and if Jesus tarries for many more, many, 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 many more years, I'll stay married to the one that God picked for me. Do you understand this conversation? In verse number 11, it says, And be ready by the third day, because on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai, in the cloud, in the sight of all the people. You shall set barriers for the people all around the mountain, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain and touch his brother. Whoever touches the mountain must be put to death. No hand shall touch him, that is, no one shall try to save the guilty party. But the offender must be stoned or shot through with arrows. Whether man or animal that touches the mountain, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified them. Can you see that? For God's sacred purpose. And they washed their clothes. Moses did his bit. I didn't see Moses washing their clothes. Oh, pay attention. Moses sanctified them, maybe by prayer or something, or by instruction. Then they went and washed their clothes. Then he told them, he said, be prepared for the third day. Do not be intimate with a woman. So it happened on the third day when it was morning that there were, under, there, there were thunder and flashes of lightning. And a thick cloud was on the mountain, and a very loud blast was sounded on a ram's horn. So all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood and presented themselves at the foot of the mountain. It's amazing that these days, we don't even know when God is in the house. Our telephones will not let us. We answer WhatsApp messages during service. We do all of those things. There is nothing sacred about the presence of God anymore. Where I was strained, especially when the word begins to go on, you can't get up, you can't go out, you can't come in. If you are outside and the man and the, the teaching begins, as far as they're concerned, we're hosting the presence of God at that point, you can't walk in. And of course, if you are inside, you can't get up and go out. It sounded like rules and regulations when I was in the midst of it. But what I learned over time as I matured is that there is a decorum, there is a protocol that we ought to have when we are in the presence of God. Think about it very carefully. Think about it. If the president of your nation walked into the room, will you be sitting? That's not what happens. We stand. The national anthem goes on, and we all stand at an attention. Whether you know the national anthem or not, you sink, or you hum something, or at least you are at an attention until it's done, until the man sits before you sit. That's a human being like you. Why do we come into the presence of God and we have no protocol? Why do we do that? When we go for formal events, there is protocol that we are as expected to follow. And none of us jumps the gun. But when we come in the presence of God, we act recklessly. And I keep saying to people, is it because people don't fall and die anymore at the altar? We do just about anything. No regard for the presence of the Most High. God was coming into the camp. Look at all the preparation to host the presence of God. I don't think it was a long manifestation of God in that place. Then look at all the rules and regulation so that they are ready and prepared to host the presence of God. I keep thinking that a misunderstanding of grace has gotten us messed up. We have so abused grace that we don't know what it is that we're doing anymore. We just act about anyhow. 
I don't understand how you get in a church service that's no more than three hours and you go out four times. I don't get it. I don't get it. Those days we will get to church for seven. We will not leave until one. Where I'm seated is where I sit until it is done. Not because someone told me to do so, but because I know beyond the ritual of coming to church, I came to spend time with my father. If I came to visit you and every five minutes I run out to take a call, think about it carefully. Would that be a worthwhile visit? But isn't that what you do when you come to church? Decorum for the presence of God. It says, it says there is a third day. It says let them prepare themselves for the third day. I'd like to say to us that there is always an appointed time with God. There is always an appointed time with God. Jonah did three days in the belly of the whale. Jesus did three days in the tomb. There is something about the third day. God said to Moses, have the people ready. On the third day, I will show up. There is an appointed time. The third day is the day of decision. The third day is the day of salvation. The third day is the day of turnaround. The third day is the day of change. Some of us don't even know when our third day happened. The Bible says in the day of his power, the people will be willing. Because these people were given clear instructions, they had to be ready on the third day. Yes, I know that your pastor may not be able to tell you in two days. But the day that is the day of the Lord, when you show up there, just act like you understand that you came to stand to spend time with God. Will you? In verse number 13, in verse 16, it says, And it, so it happened on the third day when it was morning, that there were thunder and flashings and light of lightning. A thick cloud was on the mountain, and a very loud blast was hunt, sounded on a horn's ram, so that the, all the people who were in the camp trembled. The Lord came into the camp. They had not even started. The thunders, the flashings of lightning, the sound of the, horns, uh, the, the, the ram's horn, they started to tremble. But I remember that the word of God says, the Lord rings, let the earth tremble. Verse number 18, the Lord visits Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was wrapped up in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. A smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. And it happened as the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him with a voice of thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the mountain of the Lord. And the Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain and he went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Go down, warn the people so that they do not break the barriers around the mountain to the Lord to see me. And many of them perish as a result. Moses was in the presence of God. God sends him, he says, go back down. Tell them again that they dare not break the barrier. <laughs> Why would God have told Moses, set the barrier? Give them the instruction. Moses had done all of that. Moses went back up and God sent Moses in the middle of a conversation. He said, go back down. Because the people attempted to disobey. He said, warn them so that many of them will not just perish for nothing. Also have the priests who approach the Lord consecrate, sanctify, set them apart. No one is left out of this work of consecration. For my sacred purpose, or else the Lord will break forth in judgment against them and destroy them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because you warned us saying, set barriers around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down and come up again. Go down and come up again. You and Aaron with you. 
but do not let the priest and the people break through the barriers to come up to the Lord or he will break forth in judgment against them and destroy them. So Moses went down to the people and told them again about God's warning. When you look at this, it looks like it was a repetition of the same. No, it wasn't. God had given the instructions. Moses had passed it on to the people. Moses had gone up to up the mountain to meet with God. Yet God could sense that our obedience was not complete. So he said, go back. He said, go back. He said, go back. It reminds me of how many people told me about Jesus before I budged. It reminds me of how many people told me that it mattered that I belonged to Jesus before I botched. I shrug, I shrug off many, many approaches or many, many um, ministrations to come to God. I'm just grateful he didn't kill me in the process because we live in a dispensation where there is time and time and chance and chance and chance and chance again to get it right. But God said, go back down. Moses said, Lord, you have warned them. They dare not do it. God said, go back down. Then Moses went back down and Moses did what God had told him. I need you to now pay attention because ne the next set of things that I want to say to you are not out of Exodus chapter 19. But this is me tying, bringing Exodus chapter 19 into relevance for your day. The first question, the first thing I want to say is that there is a spiritual posture that we must have to be able to come before God. There is a spiritual posture. It may not, it's not necessarily a posture of perfection, but it's a posture of humility, a humble and consecrated life. God was saying to Moses, they will try to break the barrier. You need to go back down. Just keep telling them that I am insistent that they do not break the barrier and they do not touch the mountain. Someone will say to me, ah, but the Bible says enter boldly into the presence. Enter boldly does not mean come filled with sin. Enter boldly does not mean come filled with sin. Enter boldly does not mean come filled with sin. Enter boldly is not licensed to wallow in sin. To continue and, and, and it is definitely not an absence of decorum and character. Even when we come to physical thrones of kings, there are usually palace protocol that must be adhered to. To determine or decide that there are none before God is to take grace for granted. And the Bible forbids it. Romans chapter 6 verse number 1 and Romans chapter 6 verse 12 to 13. Should we continue in sin so that, grace, so that grace might abound? God forbid. So if we take a better, if we have a better covenant today than the old one, does that negate the fact or the need for sanctification? No, ma'am. Does it negate the need for consecration? No, sir. And boundaries? Absolutely not. I think not. That's why if you listen to the conversations that Jesus had with his disciples, there was always something. The Bible in the New Covenant says that the road is narrow. It is straight and it is narrow. He says not many walk on that path. If it were free for all, it would have been wild, a very wide road. Everyone would have just been able, we could have taken our cars and driven on it. But where we, the path we get to God, in my mind, is a bush path. And so as you go, you have to continue to clear things out of your way to get to him. That's an imagery from the new covenant, not from the old covenant. I think, yes, we can all now come boldly, not requiring a third party. We don't require priests to go before us, to go to God on our behalf, like the people needed for Moses to do. I think we should come in this liberty, not afraid of death according to Psalm 16, verse 11. But beyond that is the fact that even with all of these parameters, the children of Israel didn't have the right lifestyle to support their consecration for long. So consecration goes be be beyond, I fasted. Consecration goes beyond, I do a money devotion every day. Consecration is beyond, 
all of those things. Do you get it? Consecration is a lifestyle. Consecration shows up in your character. Consecration shows up in your speech. Consecration shows up in how you do your money. Consecration shows up in your relationships. Consecration is, it just permeates and pervades every part of your life. They pushed by the law, but they didn't have personal relationships with God. That's why last week I kept hammering on the fact that when God brings us out, he brings us to himself. All of these things that God has done is to bring us to a personal and intimate relationship with him. When you don't have a personal relationship with God, you trivialize him. You come before God, there is no awe. You come before him, there is no fear. One prayer I pray for myself, I don't pray it every day, but it's a prayer I take very seriously. It's, Father, in the name of Jesus, may I never lose my awe for you. May I never become familiar with you. May I never get to that point that you'll be talking to me and I'll be acting like I'm talking to my girlfriend. May I never lose my awe of you. And it's a prayer you must, you should consider praying. Because if a man loses his awe of God, he's lost everything. There are protocols. There is a posture. There are boundaries. There are templates in God. Whether you accept it or not, does not change the fact that they exist. The question therefore is, if we're in the new covenant, is there something better than Mount Sinai? And my answer is yes. There is Mount Zion. Mount Zion is better. It is a city where God himself resides. If you read all of the book of um, Hebrews chapter 12, you will see the conversation about Mount, Sinai, Mount Zion. But I want us to read from verse number 12 of um, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse number 18, actually, from verse number 18. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 18. For you have not come as did the Israelites in the wilderness to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to gloom and darkness and a raging windstorm and to the blast of a trumpet and a sound of words such that those who heard it begged that nothing more be said to them. For they could not bear the command. If even a wild animal touches the mountain, it will be stoned to death. In fact, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am filled with fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads, myriads of angels in festive gatherings, and to the general assembly, an assembly of the firstborn who are registered as citizens in heaven and to God who is judge of all and to the spirits of righteousness, the redeemed in heaven who have been made perfect, bringing them to their final glory and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, uniting God and man and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler, more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. So yes, Mount Zion, exhibit, Mount Sinai showed God in his glory. The fear and the awe of God came upon the people. But it wasn't sustainable because they did not have the character to be able to, to, to steward that consecration consistently. But we have come to Mount Zion, the city of God. We have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who because of what he did on the cross, we have access and we have access consistently. The question is, will I take that access and throw it to the dogs? The question is, will I take that access and treat it like it did not cost God anything? And so people go around saying that we are now in the new covenant. We've come to Mount Zion. It no, nobody needs to tremble coming to God because there's no threat that we will die if we come before him. And I get it because I've seen it in the scripture and I understand it and I agree with it. However, do, is there a negation of protocol in the new covenant? Of course not. We are called to be a responsible people. And whether you understand it or not, or you agree with it or not, there is, again, a standard. 
and there is again his template. I believe it was in August of 2012. I was in Dallas, Texas, and the Lord came to me and said, you are standard bearer for your family. Some people would have gone to print a card out of excitement that they are standard bearers for their family. I wept for three days because I knew what it meant to be a standard bearer. I had an idea. I had an idea that if I was a standard bearer, then it meant that I can't be found wallowing in the things that others wallow in. I felt like it was too much a weight to put on me. And I cried for three days and all I wanted was the Lord to give me something else to be. But he said to me, I've called you as the standard bearer. You will see what I'm doing and you will declare it and your family will align. And I'm grateful it's eight, eight, eight nine years on and the Lord is still getting his work done. But I promise you, being, the, being a standard bearer is not easy because sometimes the, 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 the instructions you bring are not fun instructions. But you have to leave them and then you have to show them forth. But I don't think that I'm the only standard bearer on this broadcast this evening. I think that most of us, all of us are some kind of standard bearer in some place or the other. But what kind of standard bearer will I be if I'm the pers first person that walks, moves out of consecration? What kind of standard bearer will I be if I'm the first person that breaks the rule? What kind of standard bearer will I be? The Bible in Matthew chapter 5 calls you and me light. It calls us salt. That is standard bearing. It means that when we show up, we are bright enough so that others can see. We are flavored enough so that others' lives can become sweet. Do you dare to sit in front of God or come before God and say, what is this that God has called me to? I do not want to do it. Do you dare to do that? Do you dare to come before God and think that there are no parameters to having a relationship with him? Do you dare to do that? Do you dare to come before God and think that anything and everything goes? Do you dare to do that? Just because you will not die if you broke barrier, does that mean you should break barrier? If you said to your child, do not do something, and because they know that you are not a parent that, that, that flogs, does that make it okay for your children to do it? If as a parent you would not allow your children break the rules, even though you are not given to flogging with the king, do you think just because we no longer fall and die when we break barriers that we ought to break barriers? Think about it carefully. God has and still calls us to accountability. He wants us to live lives where we can be accountable. Grace doesn't negate judgment. I need you to know that. I'll say it slowly. Grace does not negate judgment. So to go around thinking that because you have grace, that you cannot be judged, is to waste a, good, a, a great gift, the gift of the salvation that you have received. What grace does is that it provides us the impetus to see God's love. That's what grace does. Grace opens your eyes and expands your heart to see the love of God and to embrace that love. That's number one. Then what happens is when you see the love of God, you allow that love to become the motivation that makes you submit to the standard of the will of God. Do I say that again? Grace is the impetus. It opens your eyes to see the love of God. The idea is when you truly see the love of God, that love becomes the motivation for you to submit to the will of God and not the other way around. You don't see the love of God and decide that because God loves you, you will begin to drink from the toilet. That's not what happens. When you see how much God loves you and you see what he's willing to do for you and for me, what that should do is it should inspire us to want to love God more. Those days when I used to pastor with my husband, when we, we get in that conversation about our workforce, 
And I'll be like, let's just discipline them. And my husband would be like, BMM, let the love of God propel them. I used to think he was a softy, like, let's, these people can't see it. But as I have matured, I have come to recognize that Mark has the right formula. He has a point. What grace should do is open your eyes and open my eyes to see how much God loves me. In response to that love, I, am sub I submit without anyone forcing me or coercing me. I submit to do the will of God consistently and persistently. And because we do that, we don't need to feel terrorized by the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We, the, the return of Jesus Christ actually becomes an expectation. I think that the reason why most of us fear death is because we are not sure where we are headed. From what I have heard about heaven, there's nothing to fear. Absolutely nothing. Do I believe that I ought to live long? I think so because there's still work for me to do. But will I lose anything if I'm no longer alive tomorrow? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because for me, the return of Jesus Christ is an expectation. It's not something I dread. It means that I begin to live somewhere where electricity doesn't go out. It means I begin to live somewhere where I don't need to pay school fees. Think about that. <laughs> It means I begin to live somewhere where people's bodies are not ravaged by cancer and they call me to pray and I feel helpless sometimes. It means that I don't look at a grown man who is confused and bewildered about his life and I do not know what to say to him, yet he wants me to say something to make him better. It means I don't need to deal with those things anymore. So for me, the imminent return of Christ is an expectation, is not something that I dread. But when you are not working within the standard, any slight opportunity or threat that he's returning, you begin to shake. You need to correct that. I need to correct that if I'm in that category to make sure that I work it out in such a way that if the guy is coming tomorrow, big G, come, let's go. No problem. Someone who is not married yet will say, Stabi, wait, let me marry. And I get it. Please, we're waiting. Marry. That's fine. But that should not be something we fear because it just means a reconciliation with our maker. Not that anybody is dying, but it's part of the conversation that we need to have with ourselves so that we know where we stand. Mount Zion is where God delivers to us the tool that is grace to submit to his will, not license for us to wallow in sin. Yes, indeed, Jesus is there He's the mediator of the new covenant. And everything that Jesus has brought for us is better than what Moses and the prophets brought to the people. However, what that grace does, should do for you and me, is empower you to submit, to do his will, not a license to wallow in sin. So is Mount Sinai irrelevant? Not at all. We learn by Mount Sinai how to come and to meet God, to recognize that we ought to come with flair and trembling. Do you understand this conversation? Amen, sir. Thank you for praying for me. Now to give his word priority and be receptive to him, that's what we should learn from the idea of Mount Sinai and from the idea of Mount, uh, Mount Zion. We ought to give God's word priority and we ought to be receptive to him. Mount Sinai teaches me that to be separated, called out as the church and set apart is a privilege. It's not a right. Mount Sinai teaches me the power of purity. Mount Sinai is how I recognize the power of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Mount Sinai is how I recognize the power of a set time. Because he said, on the third day. Mount Sinai is how I recognize that boundaries exist in God. Mount Sinai is how I keep the flesh under control and allow the spirit to rise to the fore and be the dominant part of me. Mount Sinai is where I learned how to know and accept God as holy. When we come next week, 
you will see the response to the children of Israel, of the children of Israel, to God wanting to have one-on-one -on -one relationships with them. And from that, you will find out that just because God did everything does not mean that we all will receive him the way we ought to receive him. There are many things that have been said this evening. What I want you to do is not take my word for it. I want you to take time, even before we close and ask the Holy Spirit to amplify this for you. Ask him to confirm if this is his word and ask him to rebut whatever isn't him. That's what I'd like you to do tonight. But if you have faith enough to believe that this is the standard of God's word, then how about you pray with me and ask that the Lord will help you and me, that we will not break barriers, that we'll always keep our clothes washed, that consecration and sanctification will be something we embrace and we live in, that we will not abuse grace just so that we can receive all that is in God for us to receive. Remember I told us today that the responsibility of your pastor is to prepare you a holy people before God. God's responsibility is to bring you all the other things that you want. So the next time you step into church, cut your pastor a slack. Just cut him some slack and just let him do that which he's meant to do, to watch over for your souls. Why God does all the other things that he needs to do for you. Remember that I talked a lot about grace. I said that grace is supposed to open your eyes to see the, the, the debt of God's love for you. And that ought to motivate you to bow your head before him and say, Lord, I'll follow you for the rest of my days. If you're on this broadcast, therefore, and you have not given your life to Jesus, maybe you stumbled on it in the course of your scrolling through Facebook today. I'd like to invite you because that's where the power is. To say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. To be able to become a standard bearer happens when you give your life to Jesus and the Spirit of God comes upon you. And then you find that with your consistent um, nurturing of the relationship, you begin to get better and better and better in the path that God has called you to. My brothers and my sisters, I know some things, not everything would have been clear to you. But that's why this broadcast are left on YouTube, on Facebook, on the app, so that you have three different ways to interact with this word. Go back to it, listen to it over and over. I think if you go to Facebook, you can download it. I think even on YouTube, you can download. Even on the app, I think you can download it. Download it and listen to it. Let the Lord work it out for you. My job is to tell you how I have been able to process this word in my life. It's what I know and have experience that I can share with you. But you can take it and the Lord can amplify it into something else for you. That's the point of intimacy. So if there's someone on this call who wants to say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life, please type it. This is what I live for, to hear someone say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. For the rest of us, what are you asking God for this evening? I'm reminded again that I'm standard bearer. So tonight I'll be doing a reflection. Am I bearing standard well? Is there something else I should be doing that I'm not doing? I need to know and I need to push it. No matter where you fall on this divide, I hope that this word is not brought to condemnation this evening. What I want it to do is to inspire you. What I want it to do is to challenge you to want to make the amends that you need to make so that your journey will be profound and so that God will be proud of you. I gain nothing from making you look small. So if that's not the intention at all, do not be intimidated. Go to God and say, Lord, I want this. I want this. He says he will fulfill the desires of your heart and he will make it happen for you. Till next week, Wednesday, if Jesus starts, when I'll come your way again, I challenge you to keep listening to the, the Spirit of God and ask yourself, what am I doing with my boundaries? Am I breaking them or am I keeping them? What is my obedience quotient like? Am I falling down on the walk of obedience? And finally, 
how do I understand grace? Because until you understand these three things properly, there's honestly some things that your hands cannot touch in God. But I pray for you and for myself this evening that whatever God had ordained from the foundation of the earth for you and me, we will walk in it. Our hands will touch it. We will taste it. We'll pass it on to our children. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining the broadcast this evening. God bless you. And should Jesus come tonight, may you not be left behind. In Jesus' name, have a good night. Bye-bye.